Hi, everybody. My name is Jennifer Webb McCray, and if you live in Cumberland County, I am your Cumberland County prosecutor. I am so happy to be back with another episode of Coping with COVID. Today, we're going to be talking about sustaining recovery during a pandemic. Um, you know, oftentimes, Families are suffering from addiction, either it's an individual or the family dealing with the problem. And we want the community to know that there is still help, even while we're social distancing. So today I have here with me, as usual, my trusty special agent, Matt Rudd, who um, does programming at my office and um, works on things like coping with COVID. And I'm really excited to have Mike Williams from the Department of Human Services. He is also a recovery coach that works with our Cumberland Cares program as well as with our um, ROW, our Recovery on Wheels vehicle. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike and allow him to introduce himself, tell you a little bit about his credentials and who he is as a person. Welcome, Mike. Hi, good morning. I mean, uh, today, uh, my name is Michael uh, Williams. I'm a recovery coach for Cumberland County and also a counselor intern for First Step Clinic. Um, I've been doing this since uh, August 2016, and my passion is to help the individuals who are struggling with some type of mood or mind altering substance issues. So, Michael, I actually got the privilege of meeting you much earlier than 2016, probably closer to 2013, um, because you were doing a program in our community um, that I know you got an opportunity to do with parole. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then talk about who you are and how you became to be a, a recovery coach. Uh, the program that I do is a program that goes around. Um, we go to different facilities and we help uh, individuals dealing with substance abuse issue or criminal lifestyle. It's called minor adjustments, which helps individuals make different changes in their lives. Um, I came to that uh, coming to that uh, coming to that type of purpose that I wanted for my life because I experienced with those same issues myself, and I had 22 years of struggling with um, different um, drugs. And since August 2009, I had dedicated my life to trying to change um, the things that I was doing in my life with dealing with drugs and everything, which gave me the turn or the passion to want to help individuals uh, who are in the same situation that I previously was in. So I uh, became um, the first step to be a substance abuse counselor, which in turn opened up the Recovery on Wheels program. And it goes right in line to me wanting to um, help individuals who are going through the same things that I previously did. And that's where my passion and desire is led, led me to. So I love the name of your program, Minor Adjustments. And yeah. I think I love it because, um, you know, people can suffer with addiction in different ways. I know my issue is food. <laughs> I love to eat. I think about eating when I'm not eating, and <laughs> once I'm finished eating, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to eat next. And every time I try to start a diet, yeah. and I say, oh, I'm going to go cold turkey, no sugar, um, you know, no flour, blah, 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 I cannot do that. But if I make little changes yes. in my life, like limit the portions, mm -hmm. I do much better. So can you talk about, like, minor adjustments and how that relates to um, addiction and how somebody maybe can kick a habit? Some of the things that a lot of times we want to take big steps, which really uh, the, the first step, like right now um, with all the pandemic and everything that we're going, we have going on, the first step is reaching out for some type of help or assistance with the issue that you might have. It might be substance, it might be food, it might be gambling, it can be sex. It can be a lot of different things. But the first step, the smallest step that you can make is reaching out and telling someone that you actually have this issue, like you're saying with food or it can be anything. The first minor step you want to make is reaching out for help and admitting that you have the issue. Once you make that step that admitting to having this particular issue, then change comes about. But the first step is admitting that you have this particular issue. And once that, once you make that step that admits you have the issue, now you look for a resource or a connection to help you get in the process of going about the change. 
you know, that, that actually brings up a good question because I think, um, you know, as people in, in stressful times like a pandemic are working to cope, yeah. you, start, you start questioning things like, am I relying on whatever, whatever you were just describing, right? Food, uh, alcohol, sex, yes. you know, uh, your obsession over money, things like that. Um, when you're talking about that self-awareness, like what are things that you would say even to, t- to know that you should take that first step of telling somebody, what would be some symptoms uh, that you would point to that would help someone know, you know, I, I should bring somebody else into this. I'm, I'm not doing okay by myself. When the, one of the symptoms or one of the signs that you have, no matter what the issue is, because we all struggle with something mm-hmm. and no matter what the issue is, you can tell when you need to bring someone on board, if you will, when you made a conscious decision in your own mind that I'm not going to do this tomorrow and yet tomorrow you pick mm-hmm. it up and do it again. And then you see in consequences. If it's, if it's eating, let's just use eating. If it's something with eating and a doctor even put, told you, you shouldn't eat that because it's going to affect you this way. And you constantly eating it, then you know you need to get more help to help you. Willpower is not going to only work. You need to get some type of connection with another resource to help you during the process. It's all a process. And you always need to connect to someone else to help you along the process. You doing it on your own. We all need something. I was watching TV today and it says that um, it was talking about how everybody's community has to help them. And he says, what happens when the community is shut down? And I said, wow, that's really true. You still have to try to find different ways to reach for your community. Mm-hmm. If the community or it, right. takes a fan, or it takes a community to raise a person or raise a child, what happens when the community is no longer able to do it? What do I do? That's when it becomes extremely important. One of my big things that I have been using with my clients at First Step is telling them about connection. My My main word I've been telling them is you have to stay connected. You have to stay connected. You have to stay connected. Call your sponsors, call your ministers, call your whatever religious belief you have, call them. You have to stay connected because you can't get to all the other resources that you normally would. And and if you don't get to the resource that you normally would, you have to find other alternatives. So what are some of the triggers that someone who's struggling with addiction might experience during this time of you know, social isolation? The one number one trigger that I have been coming across when I've been talking to my clients is boredom. When Mm. you get bored with somebody struggling with a substance use disorder, boredom can be a trigger for them to say, even though we're social distancing, I'm going to find somebody that can bring the drugs to me or something like that. When you get so bored and you end up going through the process of change because sobriety and recovery is a process, when you get to the part where you get bored, boredom can be one of the biggest triggers, especially right now. So what I've been re- recommended to the clients that I have been talking to is when you get bored, connect to all these recovery Zoom room meetings because they have the same cohesiveness and they have the same connection and everything in the groups of the Zoom rooms. So when boredom comes about, and it will come about, we people who aren't struggling with drugs are getting bored in the house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I can imagine when you're struggling with something and boredom, I think is the number one trigger right now. And that's why I recommend staying connected in all these recovery support meetings that we have these zoom room meetings. I tell my clients all the time, log on to them. Even if you don't say nothing to mute yourself, just listen. And I'm just telling them, you know, you're going to get bored. Don't panic. Don't panic. You will get bored. I tell them all the time, I'm bored, (laughs) but that's all right. So no matter, I think the number one trigger right now during this time is boredom is a trigger, but I think boredom has moved up to the top of the ladder right now. I see. So um, I will share with you that we were on the phone with Melissa Niles, who runs the Department of Human Services the other day, not on the phone, on our video. Mm -hmm. And I will share in our comments the numerous um, Alcoholics Anonymous, 12-step, I guess there's addict 
Addicts Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, uh, yeah. the programs that are available uh, electronically, they'll be in our comments once this uh, post so people can access them. So, yeah. um, you know, I know you do a lot with Cumberland Cares and you also do a lot with the Recovery on Wheels vehicle. And mm -hmm. everyone should know that the Recovery on Wheels vehicle is, we still have it. Yeah. Um, it's suspended right now because we're honoring the governor's orders, but it will start back up once we um, get past this period of social um, distancing. But I want the community to know that we still have access to programming in um, Cumberland County. Yeah. And Michael, I know you're doing that. You've mentioned it. Can you tell the community what um, recovery coaching looks like right now, how you're doing that, and, and walk them through that if they called First Step or called the Cumberland Cares number, how they would make contact with a recovery coach and stay engaged? Um, well, how we, be, we have um, our system set up. If you call the uh, First Step phone number or Cumberland Cares number, we all are checking our voicemail daily. This is our job. Our job is to check our voicemail. Each client or each client, each counselor or each person staff has to check their voicemail three times a day, at least three times a day. Check our emails daily. This is our job. If we're not doing that, we're not doing our job. And more importantly, when we connect with someone, we're doing assessments. I did an assessment yesterday due to us being closed. I'm able to still do the assessment over the phone, take the information and give the client or give the person the treatment or that's necessary for that particular individual. So nobody during this pandemic will get left behind. We will still be able to provide for people in our communities, no matter who calls, they will get a call back. If you call our numbers or call the coming and cares numbers, no matter, we will contact you and then what we're doing is all the clients that we have, our boss have, Melissa Niles has us calling our clients and we're doing um, telehealth individual sessions over the phone weekly. And then instead of us doing like um, treatment plan, we're doing uh, um, like recovery monitoring and wellness recovery over the phone. Instead of treatment planning, we're doing re wellness uh, recovery. So we're doing a lot of different things for the individual. If they have mental health, uh, needs we are we are sending them resources or referring them to different people that we are connected to so no matter who you are if you call you will be uh receive services for the situation that you have called about nobody will get so put mike inside. yeah walk walk me through like let's say i'm i'm the client right we've gotten through the assessment i've called yeah. in we've gotten through the assessment and now it's time for a session, right? So yeah. we get on whatever, you know, whether it's the phone or however you're doing it, right? Uh -huh. So what, 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 if I'm the client and you're, you know, you're the, the counselor, walk me through what happens. What, what would someone actually experience in that, in that uh, conversation? So if I'm, if my, when I call my clients, first thing I'm, I'm calling them, I'm scheduling a time when I know that I'll be able to talk to them and they're not out somewhere and they're not, you know, they're stationary and I talk to them and I'm doing basically a wellness check. And some of the things doing a wellness check is very unique when you're developed in the area of trying to be a counselor. You look for keywords. Like when I'm talking to them, they might not necessarily telling me that they're still using something. I'll use a prime example. I have a situation where before we went out, we had someone who was struggling with using Suboxone purchases from the streets. They were using Sabasa purchases from the streets. So now that I'm calling them doing a wellness check, obviously more than likely they won't tell me if they're still going to purchase drugs from off of a person. So I list for, listen for keywords to find out how can I help them. During the process of me listening to keywords, I was able to connect this individual to a Suboxone program, which a doctor monitored the program. And during that process, now I call the facility and I find out that that client has now started the suppositing program, which is monitored by a doctor. I basically saved them from getting something that might have fentanyl in it. But how did I, she, but the person never told me. I listened to keywords. I know the last time that I talked to her, she was doing this. So I had to listen to keywords. So when someone calls the counselor, the counselor does a wellness check. During the process of doing the wellness check, you want to talk. 
You want to talk. And how you doing? How's the family? Are you in, are you struggling with an anxiety because of being in the house? You just want to try to talk and fill them out, and, and hopefully you'll learn something from the client and you try to help them because our purpose is to try to put them in a better situation or help them through the process of this pandemic, more importantly, their addiction. So when the client and the counselors are engaged or are interacting with each other through the phone, they are just basically doing conversations. And during the conversations, you can give them some coping skills that they can use, which you're going to have to get very creative right now because the coping skills we used to give them was a lot of stuff going out and meeting with people. Well, you can't give them that now. So it's it's very it's very unique. It's helping the counselors to develop, and it's also helping the client to see that they actually have more in them than they actually thought, because they they're not able to go use the coping skills, go to meetings, and go out with your sponsors and hang with people who aren't using. They can't do all that. So when so, we're engaging with uh, someone that calls us, we're basically doing a wellness recovery check and we're conversating with them, talking to them and trying to figure out how we can better assist them. You, so you mentioned some of those, the, the way that those coping skills have had to change. And I know you referenced like um, the Zoom meetings for AA and NA and some of those things. Mm-hmm. But what, like, what are, are, are some other ways, if you can think of any off the top of your head, that you would say... This is, this is an appropriate coping skill that we've had to adjust, and, and this is what I want you to try or you know, give it a go. One of the things that I've been trying to get uh, 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 clients to deal with is more so conversating. And what I mean by conversating, I mean like their family, some of the clients don't have fam. some of them have families that they have around them, and some of, some of them, I just talked to one person, and he lives alone. Who is he going to conversate with in his house if he don't reach out to someone? So I usually try to tell them um, to deal with some type of, even if they have like a spirituality or take up another study, if everybody don't deal with spirituality. So if the person does have some type of spiritual background, I tell them to do some more reading on not my religious background, whatever your religious background is. Do a lot more studying and Mm. do a lot more uh praying and meditating and thinking about positive affirmation and things like that. That's mostly the coping skills I've been giving the clients that I've been dealing with because a lot of them, again, I'm very aware that everybody don't have to have my spiritual belief, but people do have some type of spirituality. So I do direct them to start digging into whatever that may be. So I do that and I tell them to do a lot of meditating, a lot of meditating and see Write down and see what comes to your mind when you think about you in recovery. What comes to your mind about the person that you want to be after this is all over? And what direction are you trying to go in? So I try to direct them to look more so inside than trying to look for outside for their number one source. Most of the source that I want to direct them to is looking for inside. Because even if they look inside and they say, I don't think I'm pretty. I don't think I can make it. I don't think that's a starting point. Now we have something that we can work on. Why you don't feel like that? Because next week I call them and say, last week you said, you know, you didn't feel like you can make it in recovery. Why do you feel like that? How can I get you to think higher than that? So it's, it's, each individual is different. So, um, do they have, when you're their recovery coach, can they like pick up the phone if they're having a moment of struggle and give a call? Yes. The recovery has a line. They could call the phone and, and, and reach out to a recovery coach 24-7. Someone will pick up the phone. If they call the number and this and it is ringing at some particular recovery coach number, if they don't pick it up, it moves over to the next person until someone actually picks up the phone and be able to talk to the individual. Wonderful. So another question that I have for you. Um, You know, we talked with Melissa the other day about the fact that there are still beds available. Even in a pandemic, um, it appears that, you know, there there's available beds. Have you been experiencing that as well as that you can get people into treatment if they need something more um, comprehensive than outpatient treatment? Yeah, so far, the assessments that I have done since we have been out all have been um, qualified or 
qualify for outpatient. They didn't require inpatient. But if we come across someone who need inpatient that like need detox from alcohol or or some of the things that possibly can kill them, opiate uh, addiction, then we're able to still reach out for different agencies that have bed availability. The same thing we do on the road or that we did when we were in operation for operation, we still do the same footwork to try to find the individual's beds that are available because ultimately our community is dedicated to trying to help people. So we're not going to forget anybody and say, well, it's a pandemic. Well, they need a bed. That's it. No, we need to put the work in. We will put the work in just like we did if we were in operation like normal. So let's talk about that a little bit because that's one of the things that I've been most excited about, about this Recovery on Wheels initiative and what the recovery coaches are doing with Cumberland Cares. You know, I, you know that I've been practicing for 25 years. I'm a little old. Um, and I, you know, used to be on the defense side and I would help my clients try to get into recovery and you'd be calling around and they'd be like, oh, we got a two week wait. We got three week wait, what have you. I'm like so excited about the fact that it feels like if people want to get into treatment that we can get them in detox and then get them into long-term programs relatively quickly. Can you talk about what your experience is when you actually have to get them into, you know, some type of inpatient treatment? Most of the, uh, what the great thing about the recovery on wheels is everybody who is a part of the recovery on wheels has made it their job to this. This is the number one key about beds. They made relationships with these institutions or the places, not institutions, the places, the facilities that they have the beds. We built relationships with them. So when somebody from Recoveries on Wheels called these facilities, being as though someone from Recoveries on Wheels had built this relationship, it's not that they skip over people, but they're more attentive to the person that's calling from Recovery Zone Will. They say, oh, that's Recovery Zone Will. They have a 100% track record of getting people when we need to get this person to bed. Everybody that comes to Recovery Zone Will is 100% guaranteed we will find a bed for you to get into. And that goes back to us having relationships. And when we have relationships with facilities, and again, I'm not saying that we will skip over somebody that's probably waiting for the bed, but being as though we develop these relationships with these different facilities, they hear that Recovery Zone Wheels have someone that needs to get in, and they know we mean business. They're going to make sure that we get this bed for this individual. So it's awesome, and it all goes back to relationships. When we talk to different people, they understand who we are. We talk to them with respect, and we understand when they say it's not a bed. We know that we have to shift over and find another facility and if they say it's not a bit, it's okay. We don't panic. We thank them. And we say, but well, we got to get off the phone because we need to call somebody else. So we just keep moving. So recovery is on wheels. Our dedication in, uh, has been 100%. We're accurate. We're 100% that everybody that came to us, we have provided them with some type of assistance that they needed. And I think the other way I would say it. And the other way I would just say, add to what, what Mike's saying, I think is so, is the diverse, um, the diverse teamwork, right? Mm. So the team approach to solving the problem puts a bunch of different um, sectors together, working yeah. together, the, the health department, the uh, human services, our office, uh, the sheriff's department, other law enforcement, recovery coaches. You get, so it's almost like when you, you know, like a NASCAR, like when, um, the car comes in and that pit crew comes in and they're like, doo, 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 like changing everything out. There's that team effect of, that we get that when somebody shows up, okay, does this person, uh, do, do they need a bed? Do they, you know, what's the, do they need a, a granola bar? Do they yeah. need um, a, a hepatitis shot? Do they need an ID? Do they need transportation? Do they, and then everybody's kind of zing, 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 zing. All these different people yeah. are, are, are doing that. Now, don't get me wrong. There, there's a significant amount of work coordination, effort, finances that go into that. But what's what's remarkable is that it's working, right? So yeah. we're, it's worth the, the expenditure of all that the resources that go into that. Yes. So yes. I want to, at this point, when you talk about that and hear both of your experiences with that, congratulate both of you because um, Matt knows I always have big visions, like, this is what I want to do. Let's <laughs> like do this. But you have to have an architect to basically build the – the house and the infrastructure to make it happen. And Matt really 
has hit it out of the park with the Recovery on Wheels program. But when I heard you talking, Michael, it really like warmed my heart and I got kind of teary eyed because, um, you know, I, I have a passion for people and I have a passion for my community. And I know that sometimes, you know, people aren't happy with the decisions I make because sometimes that means putting people away in jail. But this is my passion to be yeah. there to help people make positive choices that change their lives, that change their families' lives and change their, their children and their parents' lives because they get the help that they need. And um, just as much you know, passion as I have for making sure our community is safe by protecting them from the people that are the most dangerous, um, I have that an equal passion for helping people deal with medical issues like addiction um, that sometimes find their way into the criminal justice system. So I thank both of you for what you're doing and um, am really proud to just be associated with something that has basically tackled that treatment on demand issue. Knowing that, you know, people, they, when they say they want treatment, we got to do it right then because um, if we wait, Yep. Sometimes people's minds falter and they're not ready anymore. And I appreciate just hearing you talk, your passion on making sure that happens and, and knowing that that's the culture at Recovery on Wheels. I don't take any credit for it other than to say I was smart enough to uh, ask Matt to kind of lead that initiative. Uh -huh. um, but I'm so excited and proud to be associated with it. So thank you guys for your work. Um, You're welcome. You're welcome. So you talked about a lot, and we'll make sure that in the comments we put up the First Step Clinic yep. um, information, the CARES information, the row vehicle information. Um, some of that telephonic support, the numbers that we have. Right. There's, mm -hmm. there's some numbers there, the medication-assisted treatment information that we have. Um, I wanted to circle back, though, because I know, because you do a lot of um, – really creative videos with your program yeah. that fit, uh, fitness is something that you're dedicated to. Yeah. Is that related to um, your, your recovery work and, and the key to you being successful with recovery? Yeah. I try to tell people that um, recovery again is a process and the physical part of recovery is a process too, because if you don't take care of your body after you come out of the part where you got the symptoms out of your body, during the process of being addicted to drugs, you have accumulated a lot of health problems. And mm -hmm. after you come out of the, get the substance issue under control, if you will, you want to start focusing on your physical health because just because you went through that period of time doesn't mean to neglect your physical health. So we got to pay attention to, well, in our treatment plans, we always have a section in there like about getting rest, eating right, and going to have a physical six months. Some of the clients you talk to, I say, when the last time you've been to the doctor? They say, man, how old am I? I don't remember. And a lot of times we don't have, we have sicknesses dealing with recovery. A lot of people have sicknesses that they don't even know they have because they never go get a physical. So one of the requirements that we do at our job, our, our job, our uh, directors and our supervisors make it mandatory that we put the client has to get a physical because if we find out that the issue, the person has some type of medical issue, we're able to direct them to the resource to deal with the medical issue. But if we never put it in our treatment plans and our recovery uh, plans, wellness plans, then we'll never know. So. Physical fitness is one of the things that I love um, um, to do. I like to work out. I like to take care of myself. I ain't 100% in great mm -hmm. shape that I would be in, but I tell uh, people that's dealing with recovery or not even just recovery, you want to try to take care of yourself physically because now that they got this sickness and stuff that's going on, a lot of times, not saying everybody whose immune system is terrible is dying, but a lot of people who are uh, uh, haven't been taking care of themselves now when some type of sickness come on them, it's like, oh man, everything is a lot easier. So I, you know, I just think wellness and physical fitness, taking care of yourself, getting the proper sleep, and you know, it, it, it all plays a part of recovery. It definitely is very important when you're 
you don't know you have a sickness. My wife's a nurse and she always tells me most of the people who come to her job have sicknesses that they have medication for, but being as though they let it go so long is mm -hmm. trying to catch up to the, the, the help them. The medication is not able to move as fast, but if they would have checked it out before, the medication would take the time cycles to work. So I'm always in a, a, a very, I'm on all my clients. I know that. And I believe all of my um, coworkers are doing the same thing. Like, listen, you need to go get a physical. I need to see some proof that you went, at least come back. I'm my client, I tell them, at least come back with a car and say you went and made the appointment. <laughs> how how I always when I represented um individual clients who were criminal defendants um I would you know oftentimes they would maybe they did something and it was serious and they would maybe go to prison for like 3 years and come out right mm -hmm. so you're assuming that when they're in jail that they're not doing drugs right i mean okay. or if they if they have contact with it, it's less than what they would do on the streets. But then when they would come back to the streets, they would go right back to the drugs, yeah. which was the first realization for me that it wasn't only a physical addiction. It had something to do with stuff going on in your head, Dementia. trauma, um, you know, mental health, yeah. interaction with peers, not being great. Right. So how important is it? for you know people to deal with some of those traumas therapy counseling to go along with recovery because i oftentimes you know i have family members who have one who one really close cousin who's been clean for over 20 something years and he's doing great i have another close cousin who struggles but how but i think that some of the struggles have to do with some of the trauma that went you know went into family dynamics how important is it to deal with trauma and get counseling along with all of the recovery services? One of the things that um, I um, always tell people is a lot of times people won't admit it, but the mental part connected with the substance use disorder is very high. A lot of times people hear the mental part and think, I ain't crazy, you know, automatically the trauma or the mental issues that are associated with substance use, I always tell people to try to get, I call it the core. And what the core is getting down to the root cause of why you do the drugs. You may have a substance use disorder, but I believe that it's a core to what led you to the drug. And sometimes it'd be mental or trauma. And a lot of times if you get down to the core, we can eliminate the substance use disorder. But we have to, that deals with the first step, make, admitting that we have a problem. The first step is admitting that we have this issue. So I believe that the mental part and the trauma part is very important dealing with any substance use disorder. If you can go to um, the root cause of what the trauma was and get the mental help. And I'm not saying that the drug counselor have the mental uh, expertise, if you will, to deal with that, but we can always direct you to someone who are, who is an expert in that field. But more importantly, we have to first, that goes back to what I said about keywords. When you're talking to my clients, I'm listening to keywords that they say, oh yeah, this happened and this happened. It's actually on one of the assessment tools that we use when we're doing our assessment and, and intake. It, on a mental health form, it says, ask the question about, have you ever dealt with any traumatic event in your life before? And when there's somebody, they can circle yes. It's like 17 or 18 questions. If they circle no on all that question, but circle yes on that one, that means that they need to be dealt with accordingly with mental health or some type of trauma. It's all connected to substance use disorder. Or overall, it's all connected. It sounds like it, like um, almost like an onion, where you got to peel back peel layers <laughs> and address all of the different layers, right? Yeah. You got to peel physical, it back. In the process. Yeah, physical, mental, um, all of it, to, all of it together. That's good. Um, it's like an onion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So you just to wrap up a little bit like we planned on having lucy cologne on this call today but she we were having some um technical difficulties we want the public to know that we also have spanish speaking 
-hmm. coaches that can help. So if you're Spanish speaking, um, don't worry about that. Um, call into the number because we have someone who can call back and help you in your native language. Um, another thing that I want the public to know is that recovery coaches are, they help people through the whole process so that they can help people get into treatment and they also can help people sustain recovery if they come out of treatment. Let's say it's a detox or inpatient treatment. The recovery coach can pick back right back up with them. And maybe I'll just have you talk for a minute, Michael, about what that looks like if someone came out of like a sh like maybe let's say a 45 day inpatient program and they come home. How would you pick back up with them, and what path would you start them on? Um, let, I'm gonna use one one particular guy. He had came through the recovery uh pro, recovery on wheels um services, and he had we had gave him a bag like with all the cosmetics in it and everything. And he did this one unique thing, and and I, every time I think about it, I want to cry. He says, "Can you write your name on the bag?" And I said, "Write my name on your bag? Why?" He says, "So when I come home." And I make it, I'm gonna come and you know talk to you and let you know. And I said, okay. So me and a couple of people, I think Mary or somebody, and we wrote our name on this the bag that we give them at Recoveries on Wheels. But long story, fast forward the process. I was at work, they said a guy came here looking for you. And I was like, For me, who is it? It was that guy. He had yeah. made it and he came back to let me know, listen. I've been clean since y'all helped me with the recoveries on wheels. And they was like, you know, he had came back and he wanted to contact. He wanted to let me know. I didn't see him, but now he's connected and we do follow-ups on calling and seeing how individuals are doing and making sure they're still connected. So that's why recovery on wheels, it helps so much because even after we help them get into the facilities, when they come home, they're able to be able to be followed up on before they even go to the facility, they sign papers letting us know that they don't mind us following up with them not because we want to keep our track record at a hundred which we always will but we want to make sure that they are successful in their lives after they contact us after we come in contact with them we want to make sure that you are successful going forward in your life no matter what opportunity or what field you go to work in we want to worry about you being successful and more importantly putting a smile on your family's face because a lot of times people forget that this is a family issue. This is not just a one person issue. It is a family dynamic. For 22 years of my life, I struggled with addiction, but I cannot explain to you the smiles and the, the faces of my mother, my sisters, my brothers, my wife. When I see them and they see me, the way that they smile, it just looks so genuine. And the smile is because they see their son, they see their brother, they see their husband, and they see that he is successful in a particular area. So my passion and our heart at the recoveries at First Step Clinic is to put a smile on a family's face. Instead of making them cry at a funeral, our passion is to try to put a smile on a family's face. It is a family issue. It is not a one person issue. It is a family issue. Absolutely. So um, we love those success stories and there are many of them that, that I'm hoping that at some point we can get people to get come back and share, you know, going through yeah. the experience and that being on the other side. But I also want the public to know that we know that sometimes recovery and the attempt at recovery might take more than one time. They might, a person right. might go through treatment two or three times until they get it. And I've, had that personal experience in my family, but we don't give up hope. Nope. And if you can talk a little bit about that and maybe you're, I know you've had experiences with people who tried and failed, but then tried and were successful. Yeah. Um, and that we're, we're judgment free. We'll try as many times as you're willing to try, try to get you to where you need to be. Because just hearing you talk about the smile on your mother's face, on your wife's face yeah. to see where you are, you can't help but be inspired and it's infectious and we want other people to understand, you know, <laughs> how, how joyful that is to see people being, you know, being fathers to their children, mothers to their children, um, community members that are valued that touch people's lives in the way you're doing. So 
I say this to a lot of people, recovery looks good on you and it can look good on anybody. So talk about somebody you know who maybe tried and failed but then got it right. Well, one one of the things that um like even um uh one of the questions on here says if someone cares about a friend or a family member who doesn't even acknowledge their substance use or uh, use is causing problems, what can that person do? The number one thing is to show unconditional love and concern. So no matter how the issue might look, it might not look too favorable. They might fail miserably. They might did this wrong. They did this wrong. Show unconditional love. The unconditional love that you can show your loved ones who might be missing the mark, if you will, over and over again. If you constantly keep showing them unconditional love, the love will eventually win out. I remember I was in a car and I was talking to someone who was calling me about going into a particular program or something. And I made this statement to my wife. She was in the car. I was trying to help them and she tried to give me some advice. I said to her, babe, I got it. I do this for a living. And she says, you do it for a living, but I did it for you for love. And I said, wow. <laughs> so when she said that, she, I was telling her I do it for a living. She said, but when I did it for you, the only reason I did it for you was because of love. So the number one thing we have to do is show them unconditional love, even though they might fail, fail, fail. Show them unconditional love. And if they want to try again, tell them, dust it off, try again. Show them unconditional love. Enough. Keep this, keep this, keep it. Try again. Let's go. Keep, keep Come going. On, you want to show <laughs> it's, our, it's our recovery dance. It's our recovery <laughs> dance. So. Yeah. So, so that's my number one thing is just show them love. You know, to keep showing them unconditional love. They're going to mess up. Uh, the, 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 the people who have aced it on that first try are very slim. I tell some of my friends, I'm 48, be 49, May 3rd. I still have friends who are still struggling in the areas that I struggled in. And some of them call me and say, man, I'm proud of you. And I wish this was this. And I'm, I said, listen, don't get this twisted. I did not get it on the first try. <laughs> I just never stopped trying. So never, never stop trying. So that's the number one thing for family members who have loved ones. Keep showing them unconditional love. I know in spite of how it may look, just keep showing them unconditional love. As long as you're showing them unconditional love, love will always conquer. Absolutely. So, um, it, you know, before we close, it's a good recipe that you've talked about today. So with the recovery on wheels, you know, there's that urgency. There's that pride in the 100% track record. Yeah. You understand the urgency of getting people help when they need it because yeah. this epidemic that we're dealing with, with the fentanyl and, you know, the complexion of some of the drugs that are out there today, it is a matter of life or death. Yeah. So every time someone is willing to try, we yeah. want to be there to help. And yeah. we understand that we are changing lives and saving lives Yes. when we, when we do it and we do it right. So um, I thank you because I'm not even sure that before this conference today, I realized that that how important that recipe is, yeah. but you've kind of laid it out for me. And um, I just want you to know, and, and I've told Melissa a thousand times, we're going to be your partner. We're going to be there on the front end doing this work because this work matters yeah. and it does change lives and it does change communities. So do you have any closing words before we finish, Matt, Mike, before we finish um, and close up today? One of them, one of the things I want to leave uh, everybody with um, that struggle with some type of substance use disorder is don't panic, just stay connected. Don't panic. Mm -hmm. Stay connected. As long as you don't panic, stay connected and reach out to individuals that you know are headed in the direction that you want to go in. You will be okay. Don't panic. Stay connected. Thank you. Thank you. How about you, Matt? Um, I don't know that I can say it much better than that. I think there's some fantastic uh, words and advice that, that Mike has 
um, you know, staying healthy, uh, finding, adjusting, right? I find those minor adjustments, even that, even the aspect of coping is going to take minor adjustments now. Um, the, the, our old coping habits aren't there. So we have to find new rhythms, new normals. So um, fantastic stuff. And it's great to, to work with Mike on Recovery on Wheels. And I'm glad that we still have outlets for, for helping people in our community even now. So, Michael, you know how I feel about you. You are a Cumberland County gem. Although I know you got some ties to Atlanta County, we're claiming you. You belong to <laughs> us. Um, but I also want the, the public to know that there are many recovery coaches, and all of them have the same passion that Michael has. All of them are there to help. They've had experiences either in recovery themselves or they've uh, helped a loved one through the process. And um, Cumberland Cares is up and operational. Yes. Uh, First Step is up and operational. And we are, we'll have a party and a celebration when we get Recovery on Wheels back um, out into the community once we, ha- once we get to stop social distancing. So again, I'm Jennifer Webb McCray here with Matt Rudd and Michael Williams from First Step Recovery on Wheels, Cumberland with Cares. And we wish you the best and have a good day.